Thank you for spending your Saturday with us. Uh, I'm just here to welcome you and uh, introduce a few people, and then uh, Andreas will be up here. So uh, I'd first like to thank the, the group that put this together. Sean Whalen, Mike Dorney, Jeanette Kane, Andreas Johansson. Uh, thank you. We have uh, a lot of uh, exciting presentations today, uh, starting with our keynote speaker. Uh, just a little bit about the day. Go on neotide.org and see our schedule. Uh, this is where the keynote will be, and this is where lunch will be later in the day. And then when you go out of here, if you take a left, that's where the sessions will be in the five different rooms. So if you need any help, you can see any of the five of us, and we'll be happy to help. Uh, and so thank you for spending your Saturday with us. Uh, and it's going to be an exciting day. We have a lot of great prizes at the end of the day. If you're here, if you're not here, you don't win. So uh, we'd like to thank all of our sponsors uh, for, for uh, not only sponsoring us, but also uh, being here to answer any questions you may have. So please stop by and see them. So without further ado, I'll introduce Andreas Johansson. Thanks again. We're excited. Uh, when we put this conference together, we always have sort of that moment of doubt when we think, well, maybe we, no one will show up this year. And you know, I was telling some ladies at the table, I think last week we had 65, and so in the last this week we've been able to add four year 50 registrations. It's very exciting. So spread the word. Uh, we uh, know that since you're here on a Saturday morning, you want to be here, which is exciting to us, it's exciting to our presenters. Um, we try to set the schedule so that there's a good enough group in every uh, room for the presenters. Um, we certainly enjoy having you here. So I'm introducing our keynotes. Uh, for each of the conferences, we, we try to do something a little bit different. The first one, uh, how many of you were at the first Neotech conference? All right. And how many of you were at the second Neotech conference? All right. And then you're all here. That's amazing. Um, so for the first one, we thought we'll do some uh, Ignite talks. And so we had invited some people to do, give you some short introductions to different technology topics. And then the second one, we said, well, Let's get some really powerful women in technology to give us uh, some feedback and some of their thoughts. And then today we have invited Stephanie DeMichael to be our keynote. Stephanie started her career at um, Solon, teaching language arts, uh, and then moved sort of into parenthood, and then moved back into education, and then <laughs> just got plenty to add. And so, and then ended up in Tyler County uh, ESC as a tech integration uh, curriculum consultant there now. So that's her new role. Uh, we're excited to have Stephanie share with you um, some of her thoughts. Uh, we know Stephanie for a little while, and it's certainly one of she's certainly one of the go-to people when we want to reach out and ask for help. That's part of what we like about Neotai and how we uh, really came together is that we're able to reach out and give a phone call to someone and say, "Hey, how do you do this in your district? How does this work?" Uh, and so Stephanie's definitely one of the people that I call and say, "Well, uh, what do you think about this?" And she'll give me the lowdown, and then that's all I'll do. Uh, so that's what we're hoping that you all take away from today. If you haven't made connections with folks uh, in a different district than your own, today is really the chance to do that. So reach out, reach across the table and say, hey, you probably do the same thing as I do, right? Just ask them what they teach, ask them what they do, and then you'll make connections. It's really, really valuable in order to grow your own uh, PLM or professional learning network. So um, I guess without further ado, we're excited to have Stephanie come on up. Um, thank you. Thanks for being here on Saturday. Uh, we are, I'm, I'm excited to be here to make class here with and myself because what I love about this conference um, is that it's one of the best in the area in terms of authenticity of knowledge experts and of pragmatic ingenuity. I pulled out the, the source for that one. Um, I'm beyond honored to speak here today, especially since I literally called Andres. That will be part of my presentation, I called him in July, I was like, guess what, I don't know what I did, he's like, okay, great, you can just shut up and <laughs> So I want to thank Neil Ty, I'm really, I'm very honored to be here, and I want to thank you for the faith you have in me and the good taste you've exhibited, we have in me. Okay, to say some straight things, thank you, sorry. All right, so, I don't have a presentation title, I'm super prepared, actually I do, but I want to get, I'm like a good English teacher, I want to get a sense of my audience first. 
So this is me, Stephanie Reichel. Um, you can find me on Twitter there, if you're so inclined or not, so I don't hurt my feelings. Um, I am with the uh, Educational Service Center in Cuyahoga County. Um, that's my other contact information, and um, I assume at some point I'll give you guys the slides. So, and I'll be around all day. I'm going to be all nosy and networking with people, which is what I love about this conference. So, if you want anything, stop by, say hello. Um, that's me too. I'm a mom of two teenage boys. God bless me. Uh, in my former life, that's what I did. And in my current life, that's what I do. All right, so I did. I had a real challenging time nailing down a title for today's pre-conference pep talk. Um, every time somebody asks me about it, as usual, if you know me, I would give this long-winded, detailed explanation and not, I was looking for that really succinct title and couldn't find it. And then, you know what, after trying out a bunch of options, like a teenage girl trying out a prom dress, it eventually dawned on me that presentation titles, just like prom dresses, really come down to your personal disposition. So for my purposes, what I hope you walk away with today depends on your particular perspective and choice. I personally am digging the line all the way on the right. Um, it depends on your particular perspective with regard to the current state of education and technology integration. So here I'm going to show you a few titles I tried out. You tell me what you think. So maybe you are the type of educator who's just a teensy bit frazzled about the current state of affairs, and you're, but you know what, you're still determined to make the best of it, and you still kind of feel like you deserve a little bit of justification for the change. Maybe you are the type, and you know what, go ahead and feel free to admit it, this is a safe space, it's Saturday, we're laid back, you go ahead and be disgruntled. You know what? <laughs> You're thinking, why do I have to do everything? Why do I have to adapt and shift and cater? This was another title. Um, you know what? <laughs> yeah, this, that was the one I was going to go with. Um, you, know, you have just had it with these people, and you're advanced. You're done. And it's okay, remember, it's the safe space. Um, but regardless of which title you would have gone with, then you can vote because I'm thinking this is a way easier choice than what we got at the polls next month. Um, there is no denying that we have all been, at one time or another in our careers, asking those same questions. And in any case, I still can't quite decide on a title for this little talk, what I can share with you today is how it all got started. Um, these are both actual questions posed to me in the last six months by educators who we all might recognize as um, reluctant adopters. Okay, and um, especially when it comes to, ta to when it comes to technology integration. <laughs> one educator is from a district that's struggling and one is from a district um, that inspires mouth drooling envy. But regardless of the district's report cards, both of these educators were completely flummoxed, dismayed, aghast, affronted, and just plain appalled that they were being asked to adapt, to innovate, and to change. And we've all been there. Okay. I get it. I do. We are exhausted. We are overwhelmed. We are put upon. And I don't need to go on about the increased emphasis that we have on achieving performance-related targets and the increased demands and expectations on us and on our students, the influx of special needs students, we are doing more, this is the plain fact, we are doing more today as teachers than we have ever done before. But here's the reality. Everything evolves. Why do we have to change the way we do things? Because everything evolves. It's really that simple. Every industry, every profession, everything changes. When I'm asked why we have to change the way we do things, well, I like to go with the following examples. First, medicine. Okay, I always go with medicine. I'm like, aren't we glad? I mean, is anybody glad, not glad that surgery has evolved? Are you super happy that your doctor's using, I don't know, anesthesia over ether or like, you know, fighting the bullet or biting the, the leather strap? Hey, no one's complaining about, oh, I really wish I could go into open heart surgery with just ether. Never hear that. Okay. You know, we're all gonna log the evolution of anesthesia. You know, travel. Okay, yes. You know what? Air travel these days really sucks, but you know what? Considering the alternative, 
Wouldn't you rather be on a two-hour plane ride to Disney World instead of a 25-hour car ride to hell on your mother's stage wagon? <laughs> Don't make me turn this car around. Yeah. <laughs> really good. Yeah. And finally, you know what? How many of us are like, God, I hate this thing. I really want to go back to the rotary phone and its 47 foot extension cord. Where I would tie myself up in a closet and have my little brother trip over it. You never hear anybody saying, oh, I'm so burdened by instant access to the internet. And I'm so burdened by my ability to play Candy Crush in my bathroom's waiting room. You know, curse you, Steve Jobs. No one says that. So everything changes, and we're pretty glad it does. You know what? And speaking of the internet, okay? I do not want to go back to the days in college where I sat in my college library for 20 hours a day surrounded by these like books that reduce all my allergies. You know what? Nobody misses that. No one's like, God, I wish you could go back to those days. And yet, and yet, you know what? Why do we have to change the way we do things? Because when it comes to education, we're always asking that. Why do we have to change? Why do we have to change? Well, you know, I always answer that question with another question, which I realize is completely annoying. But you know what? What makes education so special that it's immune to evolution? And more importantly, why would a profession that, pr that prides itself on shaping the future be so reticent to change? Ironically, change is the only constant in life, and yet we are evolutionary predisposed to resist it. So you know what? Everything changes. Here's my advice. Turn it around. Embrace change, even if it makes us uncomfortable to do so. Because as we've seen, you know, medical, transportation, communications, technology industries, we need to give them major props for being willing to evolve. And you know what? Education is the one profession that gives birth to all of those other industries. <laughs> so embrace it. It's going to be tough, but we can do it. So with regard to that second title slide I had, the second question I received, you know, in answer to, you know, it's not instruction is the problem, it's the system, right? Right, it's the system, and you know what? Honestly, maybe it's a little bit of both. But you can't rebuild a structure without, you know, first assuring its durability. It doesn't matter if we are anti-standardized tests, anti-administration, anti-data collection, anti-union, anti-parent, anti-STEM, anti-STEAM, anti-evaluations, anti-technology, anti-whatever, as long as we are pro-student. And that's why we got into it in the first place. Right? Anyone? Bull Durham? Bueller? Anyone? Huge fan. Huge fan. Well, anyone in here not seen Bull Durham? Oh, buddy, go home tonight. Netflix. I think it's on Netflix. Okay. So, um, this is one of the greatest and most quote-worthy movies of all time. Um, but for those two of you who are unfamiliar with it, this baseball coach is the manager of the team. They're losing. He's completely vexed by it. He corrals them into the shower to simplify the game for them. What shower, Larry? Eight and sixteen. Eight and sixteen. How do we have eight? It's a miracle. It's a miracle. <laughs> This is a simple game. You throw the ball. You hit the ball. You catch the ball. Oh God! <laughs> it's that simple to me. I think baseball is a simple game, and by extension, I think that we are overthinking education or maybe we're overplaying it. We can't continue to be Don Quixote, sorry, English teacher, sorry, you're always gonna get these references, sorry. We can't continue tilting at windmills, confronting misidentified enemies, or pursuing misapplied battles. We need to abandon our arguments with the Department of Education, with the Common Core, the test makers, the platform designers, and on a personal level, the technology integrationists, because this distracts us from our intended purpose, and our intended purpose is to help kiddos learn. And how do we help kiddos learn? By innovating and not by ranting. We don't need to make our profession so complicated. <laughs> Believe it or not, we do have control over it. And we can reclaim that control by focusing less on the distractions and more on what matters. Teaching can be a simple profession. We teach the kids, 
you innovate your practices, you improve your teaching. All of that other stuff, annoying as heck, totally. But we are educators, and we need to remind ourselves why we do what we do. I'm going to look at this little section here, this little reality check with another sports story for the guys out there, because I'm starting to lose you, I feel like. So like, I'm going to bring the sports. Um, Vince Lombardi. Every year at the beginning of football season, he would stand in front of his players, load up a football, and say, gentlemen, this is a football. Not because they were dumb athletes who couldn't recognize that that was a football, <laughs> but pretty much just to simply remind them what was important. So when you walk in your classroom, remember what's important. It's the students. It's them. And not everything else. We have to remember what's important. Reality check number three. To those questions like, oh my god, those millennials are a pain in my hands now. We need to, can I say that? Can I say that? No, adults. Can I say yes? Okay. Um, we do a lot of, here's my response to that. Why are these millennials? And actually it's Generation Z. We're going to clarify that in a minute. This is going to be a much longer answer, sugar fans, so buckle up. <laughs> Millennials and the generations who come after will never be without technology. It is an embedded part of their lives and they plan to use it. And guess what? They expect us to as well. But before I start babbling about the expectations, there's a subtle difference. The expectations of the generations that come after us, I should probably make a clear distinction between Millennials and Generation Z. Millennials, sometimes known as Generation Y, um, they're the designated, they're, they're the generation following Generation X, most of us, all right? And Generation Z is most of our students. They're the generation following the us. So X, us, Y, and then Z. So, in essence, Generation X, old farts who don't think we're old. Generation Y, those new and semi-new members of the workforce, and Generation Z, those people for whom we are directly responsible, our own children and our students. All right, so again, why is this all important? Well, a significant aspect of both millennials, Generation Y and Generation Z, is their widespread usage of the internet from a very young age. They have been digital since diverse. You know this, we have kids. But in fact, according to Forbes magazine, in 2015, Generation Z, our students, comprised up 25% of the U.S. population, making them a larger group than baby boomers or millennials. They are coming. Like, I wanted to get the Jaws name done. <laughs> Here's the big question. This is the big question. Are our current instructional practices truly preparing our most recent graduates and our graduates to be for college and career? We all claim they are. We got the standards. We're making a college and career ready. Are we? Currently, well, we only have data on the millennials. But I'm postulating today that understanding millennials is going to help us better understand Generation Z and, and what to expect. In fact, according to a recent study, 54% of managers said that entry-level employees were only, quote, somewhat prepared to immediately contribute to a company. Career ready? Maybe not so much. And with millennials and Generation Z expected to make up 75% of the workforce by the year 2025, yes, that is 75%, the time is now to evaluate the way we do what we do. Unless you're getting a ready retirement, that just don't help. That's why we don't deal with science. <laughs> so this all started, so a few months back, my mother tweeted me a link to a 17-page ebook she found about millennials. My mother is retired, she has a lot of time on her hands, and she has six grandkids, so she's overly worried about Generation Z, and she thinks I can fix it. So she's always sending me stuff. So this guide, um, it was created by a technology company called Instructure and their um, learning management system called Bridge. And this guide was developed to help HR departments all over the country understand millennials in the workplace so that they could transform their training and development strategies because these kids are coming out of school not ready. So because my mom enjoys quizzing me on the thing shows words, me, um, I made sure I read it. It was 17 pages, it wasn't that bad. Here's what I was shocked to learn. The advice offered for grabbing and holding the attention of the short attention span, instant gratification, technologically savvy, the generation, was also wholly applicable to the advice we should be offering present day educators. 
To understand today's learners, we need to understand and digest and embrace the way they learn best. But from that guide about our millennials and by extension Generation Z. According to the Pew Research Center, more than four out of five millennials sleep with or next to their cell phones. Okay, and we all do too. All right, so let's not be all those crazy kids in that generation. No, we do it too. We're as connected as they are. So it's time to toss out the paper homework planners. It's time to toss out the study guides. I know, I'm sorry, they're not going to be super popular here. But it is time to move content online. Baby steps, do a little bit at a time. If you have an LMS, if you have a class, class website, you need to start using it. No one's going back to paper. <coughs> Here's another fact. Millennials and Generation Z are visual learners, and of course they have been trained to do so. With, but with all these apps, video games, streaming services, the internet, they are visual. So to keep today's learners engaged and attentive, we need to limit large amounts of text and instead use visual elements like infographics and videos. This is what we should be using now to present new information. That means we got to get rid of those bullet-laden PowerPoints, lectures, and worksheets. So again, a tool I love, Canva. It's a great visual. If you want to talk, anyone Canva, yeah, I see lots of great, awesome. Canva, they link. Um, Eric Hurts did uh, go on. What is it? What, and what was it? Good link. Instead of doing a thing like that, you can try to be as visual as possible and limit the bullets. So while the good news is that millennials are active learners and are driven by curiosity, discovery, and exploration, that's the good news. The bad news, this translates into very short goldfish-like attention spans. So while this is completely disheartening, it's what we have to work with, and sorry, we have to make it work for us and for them. A recent study by a science and technology think tank, tank discovered that students in classes with traditional stand and deliver lectures, um, like this one, sorry, <laughs> are one and a half times more likely than students in classes that you sit, you're going to fail. They're one and a half times more likely to fail. And think about it, universities were established in 1050. And since 1050, 1050, lecturing has been the predominant form of instructional delivery in the classroom. I, I'm English. Is that almost a thousand years? <laughs> Bad teachers, is it? <laughs> we need to include more opportunities for collaborative learning, self-directed learning, and interactive learning in our classrooms. On average, millennials share six pieces of social of content, six pieces of social content on social media each day, and five on email. This desire, and they do, it is a desire for social engagement means that we in turn need to make learning experiences social as well. I certainly don't encourage friending your students on Facebook, really bad idea. But that doesn't mean you can't extend your learning beyond the classroom by getting on Twitter or Instagram or, oh my God, I'm clutching my pearls, Snapchat. I have seen it done. I have seen teachers actually use Snapchat appropriately in the classroom. You can too, Google it. Final points to consider about Millennials and by extension Generation Z. They do prefer collaboration. Look at that, they're always grouped together. They prefer collaboration, they prefer to be connected, they want to explore, but they also want feedback. So in this day, especially you are going to attend sessions today that talk about formative assessment and feedback, go there, flock to it, learn about it. They want to know what you think. You know, even if you set up a system, you know, where you like and unlike their decisions, that's fine. You know, when you're incorporating social media, that'll work too. But are we providing, look at this list, are we providing these opportunities in the classroom? Do our instructional design and practices mirror the needs of our learners? Okay, so, so far I've addressed, we're done with college, or career. And when it comes to today, are they career ready? And what I want to talk about now is college readiness, and this is where it gets a little personal. This is where I called you in July and was like, hey, guess what? Um, okay, that kid. See, this kid is mine. He is a high school junior, and one of his favorite pastimes is hijacking my phone and, take, and loading it with selfies. Like, I, I cannot leave my phone alone because it's full of selfies. So, you know, based on that fact alone, I'm going to argue this kid is not college ready. He's a no-no. He's a no-business man. But the fact remains, he's a junior. 
And this is the year we start the arduous process of college selection, college prepping, college visiting. Um, and we made our first college visit this July to Canisius College in Buffalo, New York. Anyone go to Canisius? No, no shout outs, okay, good. I am not gonna bore you with the details of the visit because I'm sure a lot of you have been there, done that, but this was my first one, so bear with me a little bit. The last stop of the tour was the college library. And I remember remarking to Tyler um, and that since I had not graced the inside of the college library since 1993, and given that educational advancements seemed to progress at a snail's pace, I was super interested to see the inside of the college library 20 plus years later, because these are my memories. Those are my memories of the college library. And I don't know if that one on the right has anything to do with it, but I found it and I was like, oh my God, look at the chick checking out the guy who's George S. jeans and wondering if he has a better mullet than she does. And yes, I have that sweater. Okay. So those are my memories. This is what I'm thinking as I'm walking into the new college library. This is what I walk into and I'm not sure if you can see it on the back there. Okay, it's no longer a college library, it's not even a media center. This is not, Canisius College calls their library the Collaborative Learning Center. You know, I'm like, um, when, when did that happen? When did they become Collaborative Learning Centers? You know what? And I expected to walk into an episode of Hoarders. Remember your campus libraries? The, the over bulging book towers? This is the first floor library. This open, it looked, I mean, literally open space, no books. Well, and why do we need books anymore at this point? So I'm like, um, where are those bulging towers of dusty, outdated books? And um, this open space for collaboration, when did this happen? Where are the isolating study carols of my youth? You know? And, I, and then I was like, this is so bad. This is kind of cool. This is actually better than my living room. I kind of want to stay here. And then the student, no, that's, yeah. So I have a selfie loader and a photo bomber. Okay, I mean, they're, they're just awesome. It's a little bit of habit each day. You know, like special snowflakes. So, um, literally, the tour guide says to us, she goes, oh, by the way, this is the noisiest spot on campus. Not the dorms, not the dining halls, the first floor of the library, excuse me, the Collaborative Learning Center. There's no libraries telling you to shut up, sit down, and be quiet, and go back to your isolated study care. This is college today. So with millennials poised, I'm gonna wrap this up, with millennials poised to dominate the workforce, with Generation Z poised to enter post-secondary life in record numbers, it is incumbent upon us to understand how both groups think and how they act so that we can genuinely claim they are college and career ready. Because you know what? Careers are trying to get them ready. They're changing the way they do their training and development. And colleges are changing. They're recognizing the needs of this generation. So are we doing what we need to do on our end to prepare them to be college and career ready? I'm gonna argue that this group here, yes, because you came here on a Saturday to learn, all right? But we also have to remember something. Just because we've taught them, doesn't mean they've learned. We're not marathon runners, or we're, do we still have that? Is that still smart, the Olympic walking? Okay, like, I, my son had a teacher, drove me back, that's crazy, that she was like, I got covered with content, I got covered with content, I got, oh, did you fall my pal too bad, so I got covered with content, I got covered with content. We can't be those types of educators. It's not about covering the content. Teaching matters. believe I do in my heart of hearts I'm such an optimist and such an idealist still in this bitter and jaded age I really do believe that if we embrace the attributes of our current generation of students that it can work to our advantage if we can meet them where we, they are especially when we embrace the technological advancements of the present we are learners too don't ever forget that we need to try to learn the language we are change agents we can do this so let's circle back here after all this talk about students today, so I'm sitting there last night, like, I still don't have the untitled. So I came up with, after based on all this English teacher, I got to look at my, my presentation here. Um, I was going to do this. I 
I was going to do this. <laughs> Which, by the way, everyone who knows that, okay, if you have Generation Z kids, what does that mean? I think that's my kids. I saw that. What does that mean? Yes. What does it mean? You keep it real. Keep it real. Okay, so you don't touch your kids right now. I'm like, no, I am. I'm so 100. All right, so keep it real. Or honestly, I think this is the one that I'm going to choose. This is going to be my presentation title, to be honest. Thank you very much. I, I'm not taking questions now, but if you have questions, you want to talk to me later, I'm going to be around there. I got to give a shout out to Mom, Tyler, Robbie, and all of you who have endured my endless ranting for the last three years about this topic. I do appreciate all of you. Thank you so much. Um, I will also, if you are interested in further reading, I have these items, and I'll put the slide, the slides to Andres to put on the Neotype website. I cannot thank you enough. Thanks for hanging in there. I think uh, most of us that are here today feel in similar ways about what it is that we do as fashion educators, what we're trying to do. It's definitely a changing world, and by being here again, sort of uh, learning from other people and learning with people, um, you'll pick up a thing or two that will make your life easier, and you'll be able to meet your, your kids, your students, your staff, or whomever you work with, um, at least halfway. Next up, Mr. Mike Doherty from Chicago Falls is... Uh,
All right. Let's do it. We got one last reunion. I don't want to exclude anybody. I want you guys to meet new people today. Okay. Okay. That's no good. How long we wait? How many of you guys have used Twisted before? How many of you have Twisted live before? A few, okay. All right. This is a great way, especially the older kids, to go through a review session. Um, essentially, what you do is you take a stack of questions. And you're like, we're good? All right, I'm going to start the game and you guys to see how this is played. So the minute I hit create game, what's going to happen is it's going to tell you what team you're on. Here's where you have to talk to people. You need to find your team. On your mark, get, get set. All right, so here are our teams. We've got Lino, Cheetos, Cheetos, Cheetos. Are you in the same one? I got my team. Watch out. Watch out. Lisa, we're missing Lisa the 
koala. <laughs> We are missing a koala. Alright. Alright, so here's what's gonna happen. Once I hit start game, a question is gonna appear on all of your devices. Everybody in your group will have three answers. They will be different answers. Only one person has the correct answer. You need to answer that correct question correctly on the phone to keep going. It's going to show a leaderboard up here. Here's the one catch about Quizlet. If you get the question wrong, you start all the way over at the beginning. It will tell you the right answer, but you're going to start all the way over. There's 12 questions. First person or first team to get all 12 right, white, right? White wins if you want to get a prize. Are we ready? All right, here we go. Three, two, one. One. Wait. Here we go. All right. You guys should have a question on your screen. Let's see how this goes. I have this. Do you have a match? Two. Let's see. Browsing. Right. Right. Okay, I got it. You got it. So right click. The web technology is graphics. Um, I've got that too. So I have to find web Okay? Uh, okay. Uh, okay. Uh, you got the match. Okay. I don't have that one. I have a problem. Yes. I can't read the whole question. Advertisers who still use the personalized ads and the name for experience so that the ads are interested in advertising companies are that are moderating. Yay, that's a good It starts with the I don't have it. I don't have it. Okay, got it. Let's say you look at the Unicorn today. Nine. Two. Oh, 
That ends the live broadcast. <laughs> 